So let me just, just recall what we are doing, the concrete stuff now. So it's random walk in doubly stochastic random environment in general. And let me just fix the notation and, and, and just shortly in one or two blackboard. So we start, we have given a probability space with a ZD action on it, tau Z maps omega to omega in a measure preserving way such that with z in zd so this is shifts this is a representation of zd it shifts somebody asked me last time whether this is a, yes this is the case so these are shifts on this space right and i assume that this is ergodic that this is ergodic i have jump rates for my for my random walk which i denoted by by p sub k including zero so let me write zero infinity p sub k of omega right which i write okay i will tell it later and a random walk in random environment is given omega fixed. I define a, a random walk on ZD is defined with the jump rates, continuous time random walk, continuous time random walk. I write here omega is fixed for given omega, x t plus dt equals x plus k, by the way, I didn't say k is nearest neighbor, right? Uh, given x t was x, so there's a jump rate from x to one of its neighbors is p sub k tau x omega dt. So that, that, these are the jump rates. So I lift by shifting the random variable, I lift it to ZD. I could start, uh, uh, that was another question by someone so who, who is more in probability than less in ergodic theory, maybe prefers to have random variables given which have a translation invariant ergodic distribution, but that's the same thing. That's the same thing. So, so the P, so let me call these guys let me call these guys p k x omega it's a bit confusing maybe because it's the same notation but it will not cause true confusion so let me call this p x p t x p k x i don't denote dependence on omega these are random variables right which with respect to shifts in x are translation invariant and and ergodic and are elements of that space. I mean, random variables over that space. Good, still notation, I denote it by S sub K omega one half P sub K omega plus P sub minus K tau K omega. And that was the same as S sub minus K tau K omega has this symmetry and denoted by v sub k omega, the same thing with a minus, and that was minus v sub k ta, ta, v sub minus k tau k omega, right? And if I lift these again in the same way, so if I denote s sub k x b s sub k tau x omega and v sub k x b v sub k tau x omega as i did before think about this as about both of them as functions given on the edge oriented edge from x to x sub k then these will be conductances in the sense of Asaf and others, conductances, so 
positive, non-negative random variables defined on unoriented edges, taking the same value on both orientation and positive. And these will define a flow on the, on, on the graph, a flow on the graph because these are oppositely oriented. So these, these are negative and oppositely oriented edges. Right? These define a flow, these define conductances. And my conditions were double stochasticity, double stochasticity, so condition, I just repeat now, was sum over k in, I didn't denote now, this is the set of nearest neighbors, four, in two, four elements in two dimensions, two d elements in d dimensions, of p sub k omega be equal to sum over k in E of p sub minus k tau k omega, the flow in, I mean the rates pointing inwards sum up to the same as the rates pointing out, outwards, which is the same, look, go there and check, that sum over k in E of v sub k omega equals zero. And let me come back to this relation, what I call a flow, without that. Without that condition, I call a flow a field, a, random, a sequence of random variables defined on the edges of a graph which are oppositely oriented on oppositely, op oppositely signed on oppositely oriented edges. These correspond, if you take it on ZD, if you think a little bit about it, Algebraically or formally, they correspond to a vector field on Rd. A vector field on Rd has this type of property. So the discrete analog of a vector field on Rd is a flow, what I call a flow. If I add this condition, this corresponds in continuum to divergence free, being the flow being divergence free, sourceless. So this is a flow and this is a sourceless flow. So this is my first condition. Yes, and, uh, and from this condition immediately it follows, I should have said, in be said before that I'm looking at the environment process eta t, which is the shift to the random position of my random walker of omega. So that means you move with a random walker and you look at your environment from the position of the random walker, right? This is a Markov chain or continuous time Markov process which is stationary and ergodic there. I told that already, yeah? And I also told that this is exactly the condition that this be stationary. Otherwise, if, if I don't have bistochasticity, I have a random walking random environment without the bistochasticity condition that this will not be stationary. So this is the stationarity condition. And I gave other motivations why this is the most interesting object for me. Right? Okay, more conditions. More conditions. I denoted, I denoted the, f the, 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 conditional, the conditional speed, the conditional speed, so expected value of dxt given xt is omega, is uh, x, and here an omega with fixed omega. This is the conditional ex expectation of the infinitesimal displacement in the next infinitesimal time, right? And you easily write, you easily find that this is sum over k of k times pk, but I write pk like s sub k tau x omega plus sum over k, k times v sub k tau k omega. This is just k times p sub k. I took this one constant, so the, but now I came back, come back to this might be variable. I denote this like, probably like psi tau x omega and this like phi tau x omega. These are in Rd. are vectors, because the displacement is vector, right? And these are the, these are the condition, these are the, 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 okay, 
the, the drift, the local drift, this will be harmless. And I said that harmless from some reason, I will tell you, I will let you know why. This is the interesting stuff because this comes from the, from the non-self-adjoint part. So this is my object of interest. Later, I will take S constant, and then this is simply 0. But for the moment, I keep it because I want to state my result in the most general form. And when I prove, I make special, con special uh, restrictions. Right? This is harmless. And I tell you why this is harmless. This is harmless because it's essentially a gradient. It's essentially a gradient. Note that, note that psi, the ice component of psi omega, OK, with tau, with tau x, you just shift it. Right? The ice component, if you use if you use this, will be something like something like SI. Okay, S. The ice component. Let me put K sub i is the unit vector in the ice direction, not the negative. And a bit duplicating notation, but I will not duplicate because. S sub k i of omega minus S sub k i of tau minus k i omega. I leave it for you. It's a one line thing to check from there. That's the psi, which shows that it's essentially a gradient. And we'll see later. You don't see it right now. Why? But that makes it easy to handle. Because I will have to invert some operators and so on. So it's important that this guy is a gradient. But this guy is not a gradient. And that will make this one. I just want to tell you why, when I say that this is harmless, I don't have big problems with this one. And I will take the special case when s is identically 1, just to make things simpler in formulation. That's why I say. That's why if you, if you don't have this one, that's the random walking random conductance case. And the random walking random conductance case is very well understood. And the reason why it's very well understood is exactly this, that it's a gradient, that the, the drift is a gradient, or a derivative, time, uh, space, spatial derivative. That's a very, very important remark. Good? So that's my object of, of. And my next condition, so my condition was this one, this one. Ellipticity Ellipticity, which means that S sub k omega is larger than some S lower bar, lower star, which is strictly positive, almost surely. And this is an essential, unfortunately. I'm struggling to get rid of this condition, to weaken this condition, and that would be a great step forward. But this is it's technical, but something which, which, uh, which I can't get rid of, and it would be nice to get rid of this. So this is mine that the ellipticity condition, this strong ellipticity condition. This means that the symmetric part of the jump rates are bounded below. In the random conductance problem, if you don't have the, the non-self-adjoint part, if this is 0, that means that the conductances Put on your, put on your edges of the of the lattice, are bounded from below. You are not allowed to have. There is a, a strict positive, positive lower bound. That's a restriction. I have to live with it. And the last condition. So this is my second condition. And the last condition. Okay, I make another condition that the integral of the v's. Uh, sorry, the integral of the phi's, which this means the same, the integral of the v's is zero. So the v's have zero mean, which is the same as the phi's have zero mean. But this will follow. This I formally, why I make that condition? Because otherwise, my my random walker will have a drift. I don't want my random walker to have a ballistic drift away. I'm interested in a random walk which doesn't go away with linear speed, but diffuses. So that's why I assume, but I don't write separately because it will, it will follow from the last condition anyway. 
the h minus 1, and this is where I stopped last time, and I wasted now 10 minutes, but I think it's worth because people don't get lost. The h minus 1 condition, as I formulated it, remember it was that if I write, if I write c of x, let me say ij is integral phi i omega phi j tau x omega d pi omega and c of i j hat p, it's Fourier transform. Mind, this is covariance matrix of drift at origin and drift at site x. But I could shift all because it's translation invariant. So drift at some, po some point z and drift at some point z plus x. So it's covariance of the drifts, right? And it's Fourier transform is sum over x in zd of uh, e to the i p dot x c i j x, where p is in the, in the box minus pi pi to the d mind. The pi denotes two different things on these blackboards. There was a measure denoted pi, and this is 3.14, right? So this is a Fourier transform. In principle, first of all, in principle, and actually, the Fourier transform will be, I didn't say much yet about this function. So this is, in, this is, a, this is, a, this is a distribution. This is a tempered distribution on, on the box. So it's not a function. In, it could be a distribution. It's positive definite as a positive, positive definite measure valued object. It's a positive, uh, the C sub positive, uh, positive definite matrix measure. So this is actually formally C sub i j p d p formally by Bochner. Bochner's theorem, this is a positive definite matrix valued, so the values are not numbers, but positive, <laughs> positive definite matrices measure on the, on the box, Borel measure on the box. In, lock, in, in good cases, it could be a function, it could be a density, right? Now the condition, the h minus 1, the h minus 1, and by the way, by the way, if phi doesn't have zero mean, then this measure has an atom at the origin. What homework for you in Fourier analysis, an elementary Fourier analysis. If that measure, if this measure, uh, sorry, if this random variable has, has non-zero mean, then, you, then these covariances this covariance, the Fourier transform, the covariance will have a, an, ato an atom at the origin. But now I put the h minus 1 condition. This was not yet the h minus 1 condition. It was just definitions for that. The h minus 1 condition, and this is the first disguise. You will see three more. Is that integral on minus pi pi to the d of c hat i i. By i i, I mean sum from 1 to d of p divided by this function d sub d hat of p will play a role, important role in, in many times, so I just will define it. d p b finite, where d hat of p is the Fourier transform of the Laplace of the discrete Laplace operator, or 1 over d hat of p is the green function on the lattice, is sum over i from 1 to d, 1 minus cosine of pi i. In continuum, this would be just 1, one over p squared, p norm squared. But on the lattice, you have other things. Clear? And it's clear that it's, it's the Laplace transform of the, is a, sorry, it's the Fourier transform of, of the discrete Laplacian. Who can see that this is the Fourier transform of the discrete Laplacian? Hands up. No one. Hence, bravely up those who see that this is the Fourier transform of the discrete Laplacian. One person. 
the discrete, okay, the discrete Laplacian, this is a delta which is coming that it will denote different things. That's why I'm a bit afraid to write it down because I have two types of Laplacians. This discrete Laplacian on a lattice, you have a lattice function is sum over k neighbors f x plus k minus f x. This is the infinitesimal generator of simple symmetric random walk. Infinitesimal generator of simple symmetric random walk. This is convolving the function f with a kernel, which you easily write down. The kernel is 2d on the diagonal and minus 1 on the, on the off-diagonals and 0 otherwise. Right? And if you take Fourier transform of that, you must get this, possibly with a 1 half or with a 2, with, a, with a, some constant multiplier. Good. So this is my condition. And maybe you don't understand it yet because it looks very, very formal. I mean, it looks like something you don't have insight to. But I tell you a second, these guys. I erase this one. But no, I don't erase because you will, you will need it. Second, these guys. So let me put it here, h minus 1, first, these guys. And h minus 1, second, these guys, which you will love more because it makes sense for you. You have the random environment put down. You have these fields phi. These are random, this is a random field on the lattice, right? Now take a random walk. Let me call the random walk some name, W, T, is just a simple symmetric random walk Continuous time random walk on ZD with jump rate one, say. Simple symmetric random walk, the most simple object you have seen in your life. Right? Independent of omega. Of pi. Okay, independent of all random variables. So given on an, ind an independent, independent of all those random variables you have seen so far. And denote, take integral from 0 to t of phi tau wt omega, wt omega dt, or ws omega ds. That means you integrate this field along the trajectory of an independent simple symmetric random walk. Now, those of you who have heard about this, this has a name. It has the name for some historic reasons, random walking random scenery, as opposed to random walking random environment. Because the environment doesn't influence at all the walk, but you, you observe, you integrate out a random field along the random walk trajectory. Right? Divide by square root of t, square root of t, phi is zero mean, so you, you expect that this guy will be, so you, I ask about the diffusivity of this guy. Take expected value, and by expected value here of the square, and by expected value I mean expected value with respect to the walk and omega, all. This be finite, uh, I don't have, space for limit. Limit as t goes to infinity of this guy be finite. It has a limit for some very simple reason. So here there is no problem with not, the limit not existing because the, the ordinary random walk is a very simple object. This guy has a limit, is has a finite limit, is equivalent to this. So that the field integrated along a Brownian motion trajectory, along a random walk trajectory, ordinary simple symmetric random walk trajectory, which has nothing to do with my random walk in random environment, by the way. Let me emphasize that this is finite. This, has, this is diffusive. That's, uh, that's the, that, that's these two are equivalent. Uh, if you look at the paper, there is a sort of sketchy proof there. 
but it's better if you prove it for yourself. This is elementary exercise. Okay, not, I don't say totally elementary. You have to be a bit at home with why, why the green function appears here. The green function appears here because the Laplacian is the infinitesimal generator of ordinary random walk on ZD. Right? And if you start computing this, you will find in the end something like, you will find in the end, when you compute this limit, you will find probably a two in front. There is always a two in front, if I guess. Phi, so how should I put it? Phi minus Laplacian inverse phi. But now, again, I, I denoted another type of, of scalar product to make difference. Now take phi x, by this I mean sum over x and y in z of phi x, the phi x is phi of tau x omega, Laplacian inverted x, x y, phi y, right? So if you have a fixed field, phi, and you integrate it along the random walk trajectory, you make the formal computations, you get this for the, for the limiting variance. Homework for you. Mind, Laplacian on the lattice is the infinitesimal generator of ordinary simple random walk, simple symmetric random walk on the lattice. And that's why you get the inverse. It might be infinite. It might be infinite. But you have to take, so I do a little bit formal things now, but that's the, that's the sense of the computation. This still depends on omega, so integral with respect to omega. Because you have, you have to integrate out, so these are dependent. These are tau x omega, tau y omega, d pi omega. And this is formally what, what is written there. And this is homework for you. And if you look at that, that's exactly by Fourier transform this. Clear? Clear? So so. Intuitively. Intuitively is clear. That's more than nothing. Good. So that was my h minus 1 condition. You will see two more disguises of the h minus 1. But before I go on, I state my theorems. Uh, do I state my theorems? OK, I state my theorem without writing on the blackboard because I want to state formally in true, full, in full splendor, if you wish, uh, when, uh, when I have everything at hand, well, all notation at hand. So, but my theorem will be the following, that under these conditions, the central limit theorem for the random walk in random environment holds in two different ways. One, with uh, sort of averaging around, uh, 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 with respect to the environment that is annealed, but something stronger than that. That's what I'm not putting on the blackboard because a bit more is needed. But it's also true, and this is the strongest statement, uh, for almost surely, almost surely with respect to the environment. But I have to make one more, one, one, more, one more remark. I didn't say anything about the S. Upper bound on S. I left it, I left it free because, because I want to comment on that a little. So there is something more to come about S, how S behaves at large values, but, but that's later come. Now let's go to our Hilbert space because some are functional analysts here are, are very, very impatient to see some operators. I did all these general blah blah about operators and all that, but you haven't seen yet a Hilbert space, a concrete one. My Hilbert space is L2 omega pi. Uh, let me take it orthogonal. Let me take. Okay. H is.
H is those phi is fixed already, F in L2 omega pi, it could be complex valued if you like, for which, ha which have zero mean. I simply factor out a one dimensional subspace of constants because I don't like them. It's just nuisance. And now I define some operators on that. There will be some more Hilbert spaces later, well, one more Hilbert space later, but for the moment I define some operators on that. Who are here who like operators? Hilbert spaces and down to earth concrete linear operators and invert and that's all. Nobody likes them. There is one at least. But. So my first, but I need them. Anyway, I need them. I will denote a Laplace uh, gradient, gradient K. But mind, this will be gradients on the Hilbert space. And that's why I said that I was afraid to write down the delta, because delta will have a different meaning now. This acting on a function, so this is, OK, these are operators from H to H. So I don't write linear operators over H. F omega, the most natural thing, F tau k omega minus f omega. This, is, this corresponds to gradient. Shift by 1, k is one of the neighbors. Right? k is one of the neighbors. Shift by 1 and subtract the original value. That's exactly the gradient. That's something corresponding to gradient. Easy, not, ho not even homework, but, but convince yourself that it's adjoint is equal to minus k. It's a joint is, is Laplace and minus. Mind that k, k is this vector minus k is that vector. k is this vector minus k is that vector. Good. Uh, other operators which are very important. Laplacian. Laplacian. OK, we'll have many ways of writing it down. There are two ways of writing it down. Uh, yes, maybe I will denote this operator. I will give a separate name to, to the shift operator. I will denote this t, t sub k of f omega. It's just application in a sense, but we, it's, it's slight difference of speaking of the operator acting or the shift acting on omega. Laplacian, there are many ways of, of defining the Laplacian, so I will define it like, I will define it like, and I don't take responsibility for twos and one halves. There might be constants here and there, twos and one halves, which don't match, but, but I don't check now these things. Twice sum over k in E, Laplacian of k, uh, gradient of k. What, what does it mean? Add, if you add all these, you add the shifted values at the neighbors, and each time you subtract. So some of the shifted values of the neighbors minus, minus uh, the correspondent 2d times the value at the origin. That's exactly a Laplacian, discrete version of a Laplacian. This is the same 2 or 1 half. I question this. Let me, let me leave some constants here free, because I didn't check now how to put the constants. They have everything just, just, just fit. Which is the same as sum uh, k in E, and probably with a minus sign of Laplacian k, uh, gradient k, gradient star, gradient minus k, or gradient star k. Homework for you to check. It's, again, might be constants, some factor of 2 or 2d or something like that. But these are fixed constants which don't matter much because it's just a constant factor somewhere. Right? And from here it follows, of course, that these are all bounded operators, by the way. The, the norm of this guy is at most 2. The norm of, the, of this guy is at most 2d. No, 4d. It's less than 4D. So these are bounded operators, right? Uh, from here, it follows that Laplacian is self-adjoint and negative semi-definite. Actually, it will be strictly negative 
negative, let me write it like that. Why? Because it's operator times it's a joint, it must be positive definite. I have a minus sign there. Ergodicity, ergodicity of, of the sphere, ergodicity is equivalent, and this is homework for you, that Laplacian, the only zero eigenvalue of Laplacian is the constant, the function to belong to, to, to the zero eigenvalue are the constants. So I, as, I, as I factor them out, there are no zero eigenvalues. Yes? That delta f equals zero implies f equals constant. But the constants are factored out. This is equivalent to ergodicity. That's homework for you. It's not totally, dif uh, it's not totally trivial. It's, it's not a difficult thing, but there is something to prove there. Right? And OK, these are sort of trivial things. Since this is a self-adjoint operator, mind, all operators defined only in terms of shifts commute between them. So they have a joint spectral representation. They have a joint, there is a, a spectral theorem the spectral theorem tells you that there is a joint spectral representation of them. There is a joint decomposition according to, you can diagonalize them jointly between quotes, between quotes, right? So in terms of the spectral theorem, I can define Laplacian to the one half, which will be a bounded operator because well, square root of a bounded operator is a bounded operator. And Laplacian to the minus one half, which is unbounded. And this is the most important unboundedness in our story. It's unbounded because it's true that delta doesn't have a zero eigenvalue, but the spectrum of delta is there at zero, densely. So it's not invertible. It's defined only densely, densely defined. And this is the space which I call the h minus 1 space, the domain of this operator. So h minus 1 will be the space, now, now it's not for the condition, it's for a subspace, is those f's in H for which, okay, if you want I write it as limit when lambda goes to zero of f lambda identity minus Laplacian inverse f is finite, Which means that, that f, in the end, you can define f Laplacian inverse f, which will be the norm squared of Laplacian. So this, this limit is Laplacian minus 1 half f norm squared. So this is the domain h minus 1 is the range of Laplacian to the 1 half, and it's the domain of Laplacian to the minus 1 half. All this sounds very abstract, but it's not abstract. In this particular case, it's absolutely not abstract because you have Fourier transforms, you have Fourier representations. You can see on the lattice, on the lattice, you can write down a matrix which corresponds formally to the lap lattice Laplacian to the minus one half. Do you understand what I'm, what I'm saying? So take the Fourier transform of the Laplacian, which you, you don't see it anymore, one over square root of d, what I wrote, square root of dp, that will be the Fourier transform of a function and take the shifts the shifts weighted with that function, sum the shifts weighted with that function, which is the inverse Fourier transform of square root of that d, d of p. Mind that this is an infinite sum which doesn't make sense in the norm. It, it not converges in the norm, but it converges in a strong topology. So you have explicit expressions. This is not a mysterious object. This is not a mystery. And now I define yet more operators, I'm sorry to tell you. Gamma sub k, and these are called Ries operators. 
Whenever we speak about something named after Rees, we think about whom? <laughs> I ask, uh, anybody has some answer to this? Yes? The the Laplacian is not based on random environment. The Laplacian is defined here. I have the space of the environment. I have a space with a shift. This is pure ergodic theory, which I, what I'm telling you now. I have a space with a shift, with a shift which acts in an ergodic way. I have a probability space, a probability space with a shift act, acting in an ergodic way. I define the shift operators. And in terms of the shift operators, I define other linear, bounded linear operators on, on that Hilbert space. So it has the name Laplacian because it behaves, it seems like a Laplacian, but it's not the Laplacian acting on ZD. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the, the way the randomness shows up in H minus one is because that's an inner product, so you're integrating over here. Uh, you will see how why I call it H minus. So for the moment, I call H minus one this space. And I tell you that the third disguise of my H minus one condition is that the function phi is element of this subspace. This is a dense, but not full subspace. So H minus one is dense due to ergodicity. I don't define yet gamma then. Some notes, H minus one, as defined here, it's very clearly defined. Those functions phi, f in, in, the, in the Hilbert space, for which this limit is finite. And I tell you now that this expression, this limit, is exactly what you have seen in the second disguise of my h minus 1 condition. Right? Now, this is, this is dense. This space is dense, so there are many of these. But not all, but, uh, but not equal, right? Because except in trivial cases. If there is a gap in the spectrum, then, then it's equal, but that's, those are the boring cases, the not, not, not interesting cases. Yes, and there was something else I wanted to say. Was there something else you asked? Yeah, yeah no, I wanted to end h minus 1. Now the condition, maybe it's not good notation, 3 condition, so my condition, which was the h minus 1 condition, the third disguise is that this function phi, or all its components, phi i, is in h minus 1 for i goes from 1 to d. This is the same. And it's the same because what you see here, this limit, is exactly, and this is, I don't have time to check everything, this is really once you know what Fourier transform is, and once you know how to, how to compute uh, scalar products and so on, so elementary. So this is the same as what I told you before, uh, the second disguise. There was the first disguise, the second disguise, the first and the second are equal because this delta up in the ZD is the infinitesimal generator of ordinary simple random walk, and the third is because, because this formula here is exactly the same formula as what you have seen in my second disguise. And this is to be computed, but it's a two-line computation. Good. And I go on with some with operators. I go on with operators. <coughs> I define the Reese operator, and I, I ask the question from the audience gamma sub k, and this will be the Reese operators. And I define them, and then I ask the audience. Here again, k is in E, is defined as Laplacian to the minus 1 half times gradient. Anybody has seen an operator like this in, R, in RD? In RD, so something like in RD, and that's how in RD, Laplacian minus one half times gradient. Anybody has met something like this before? It's a very, very natural thing in, in potential theory. Hands up who, who has seen. How did you call it? Reese transform or Reese operator? And who is Reese? 
OK, I have to make some propaganda for it. Which Rees? Now, that's the brother. Rees, I ask because people confuse. There are two brothers, Frederick Rees and Marcel Rees, who were great mathematicians, Hungarian mathematicians, who, who of the first half of the 20th century. And people tend to attribute everything what's written with Rees' name to Frederick Rees because he's maybe the more famous for the functional analysis foundations. But in particular, this one is by Marcel Ries. Any? No? Anyway, what's important here, a very important remark. So this map, this is again, it looks like something very oddly or not well defined because this is an unbounded operator. This is unbounded. But in front of it, there is a, 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 a gradient. This is a bounded operator. That's the, that's the interesting thing. This is a bounded operator. So the, the, the norm of gamma is probably, I don't, so anyway, it's, it's finite. It's 1 or, or 2d or something, depending on how you, how you define your constants. Anyway, it's finite. Is 1, say, or 2d or something like that. And why? You know, it's the same. By? By, 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 singular, uh, by singular integral. It's not so singular. Yeah, but, but it, has... it looks like singular, but it's not so singular. I, 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 so this, OK, the force, let me show you the power of spectral analysis. So this is an unbounded operator, only densely defined. This is, on the other hand, the gradient, which is a bounded operator. It may be the case that this is unbounded. Who knows? By the way, the two commute because all are everything so far is defined only in terms of shifts. All operators have seen, you have seen so far commute, right? In spectral terms, so the spectral, the spectral representation, these look like my functions of square root of sum over i from 1 to d. 1 minus cosine pi. And up there, I have a shift minus 1, which gives me an e to the i times p dot k minus 1. Right? And OK, so this is a spectrum. This is a spectrum and you, when you write down the spectral integrals and so on. This is the function in the spectral expressions. This is the function which represents that object. And this is a bounded function. You, define, you divide by something exploding at 0, but where this guy explodes, this, this, this cancels out. And cancels out properly. So this is a bounded operator. That's a very, very important thing. This is a bounded operator. And I need. I need some more operators. These will, be the, these will be all the operators defined only in terms of shifts. But I also have other operators because I have these functions v. So let me define the operator m sub k f omega be the multiplication with v sub k omega uh, f omega. And let me denote m sub k f omega b multiplication with uh, s sub k omega f omega. These are multiplication operators, are self-adjoint. If I assume that these functions are bounded, then these are bounded operators. If I don't assume that these functions are bounded, then I have to be a bit careful which f is, f's are, are, are good for them. Let's assume that these are bounded. Let's assume that there is an upper bound on the jump rates. Let's assume that there is an upper bound on the jump rates, and these are bounded. These are bounded operators. These are all the operators I need for the moment. And now I write down the infinitesimal generator of the walk. The infinitesimal generator of the walk, what does the walk do? OK, L f 
omega, what is the infinitesimal? What, does, what happens in short time? It steps to one of the neighbors with rate p, right? So that's p sub k. Let me put p sub k as, as s sub k omega plus v sub k omega. These are the jump rates. times shift f sub tau k omega minus f omega. Am I right? So what happens is, the, what does the infinitesimal generator to f takes the expect, mind, my, my, OK, I told already, but I repeat, the mark of process I'm looking at is the environment as seen by the random walker. So this is the infinitesimal generator of that process. What happens? In infinitesimal time, with rate corresponding rates, it jumps to one of the neighbors. And what is the change in the environment seen by a shift? So with that rate, it's shifted by that. And you have to subtract to the, the, the original value to have infinitesimal generator. Now, if you take all these operators, which, uh, which uh, and mind that s was bounded below. s was larger than s star. Yes, time is running fast. I thought to tell you more about varying s. Let me say that s is, one. S is identically 1. Let me go to that. Because I simply, I don't have no chance to say in most generality everything. So I told last time, now this morning, I thought that I'd tell you more details about the varying s. But I simply, time is so fast learning that I don't have a chance. So. Let's take s equals identically 1, and only v varies, and then we don't have, then we, we I, OK. And trust me that it's more general than that, but you find it in the paper. Good. So s is identically 1, then this operator is not needed. Then this is 1. And all the examples I gave you were like that, so by the way. This is one, and then what is my then what is my infinitesimal generator? The symmetric part gives you sum over all neighbors this averaging. That's exactly the Laplacian, isn't it? Laplacian f of omega plus, and what is that? Sum over k in nearest neighbor. This is multiplication with m, so m sub k. Gradient k f omega. So the infinitesimal generator is Laplacian. Probably a 1 half should be there to be more familiar. Plus sum over k in E of m sub k la, uh, gradient k. And all operators you see here are bounded. All operators you see here are, bo are bounded, right? And, uh, and my first very, very simple claim, which is left as a homework, is this is self-adjoint we have seen already. This is skew self-adjoint. This is skew self-adjoint. So here, here, here is a commutation relation. So that bistochasticity or divergence freeness implies or is actually equivalent to saying that sum over k m sub k Laplace, uh, gradient k is equal to uh, plus, say, sum over k gradient minus k m sub k equals 0. The commutation relation follows. And I leave it for you as a homework. This is just straightforwardly equivalent if you see what the operators are. This is straightforward in a straightforward way equivalent to this is something like okay, I don't okay, homework, check it. So I have two ways of writing the Laplace. I have two ways of writing the infinitesimal generator. It's Laplacian plus sum over k mk gradient k, which is the same as Laplacian plus sum over k minus gradient minus k m k. And these are the same thing. Mind that m is self-adjoint, m is self-adjoint, and, and this is the adjoint of that. 
So if you join, if you take a joint of this guy, you get that guy with a minus sign. That means that this is two self joint part. Right? Good or good. Now let me run a little bit ahead to show something why I have why I need the why the race operators are so important. As I told you in the general part of the theory, but I want to go as far with the operators and with this stuff to let people know what the problems are as I can. Mind, remember, okay, so mind that in this case S is minus delta in my old notation and A is this sum over k gradient minus k m k or the other one, or the other one, right? And remember that the key point in my, at the end of my theory was to understand what the operator, we define an operator which I called B, between quotes because I have to give good sense to it, which is s to the minus one half A s to the minus one half. And now I try to come here and see what they are. I take both. This is A. This is uh, this is A. So this is in one way I write it. If I take that way, I get Laplacian to the minus one half sum of m k, and I have gradient times Laplacian to the minus. But that's the risk. Gamma k. If I take the other one, if I take the other one, I get minus, what do I get? I get res sum over k. OK, I could put sum over k in front if you wish, doesn't matter. Sum over k, gamma k gamma minus k, mk, Laplacian to the minus one half. Formally, this is very formal, no meaning yet. But I took the, these two things are equal. I sandwich them both between two unbounded operators and take care. Unbounded operators are, are very tricky things. And I got two different things. You would say the two are the same. But the two are not the same. Because you have to care where you define them. The second one, if you define this operator on the space h minus 1, where this guy makes sense, you start from h minus 1, get a vector, get bounded operator, and you are done. If you take this one, you have to start with some functions such that you land in the domain of Laplacian. And this is a different thing. And I run a little bit ahead. Proving, and actually what you see, this is a smaller operator than that one. I mean, uh, defined on a smaller subspace, both dense. This is the adjoint of that fully closed operator on the subspace. I've mentioned it with plain words. It's a fully defined closed operator, which is the adjoint of that, or minus the adjoint of that. And the work will be to prove that the closure of this operator, as defi I define now, is equal to that operator. So here is the tricky thing that where we go ahead, everything looks like trivial, simple commutations, and so on. And when you arrive to an unbounded operator, you have to be very careful. And it turns out that these are two different objects. This is the extension of that guy. This is the adjoint of that guy. But. You have to struggle to prove that when you close the graph of this unbounded operator a priori defined on h minus 1, you get this. And that's work, not trivial work. And by the way, that will lead to a geometric problem, to a, to a, not to an abstract problem. Good. And now I'm about ready to state, <laughs> I'm about ready to state a, a Another, and probably the last disguise of the h minus 1 condition, which is very important, I leave gamma here. I leave gamma here. I, uh, and that's, uh, yeah. 
Let's go back to the 19th century, to Helmholtz, who has done some sort of electrodynamics. One, with one hand up, sort of. There is the famous Helmholtz theorem, which says that if you have a divergence-free vector field on R3, it arises under some conditions. It arises as the curl of the rot or the rotation of another vector field, which in physics is called the vector potential. Anybody recall something like that? Never heard. Never heard. So Helmholtz's theorem. Back in the late 19th century, I don't state it in very clear in, in, in the most uh, in, the, in the most clear mathematical terms, just as a as poetry, but it's essentially the same. Let V be from R D to R D uh, R three. Sorry, Helmholtz did it in three dimensions. A vector field which is smooth. And assume that it's divergence free. Assume that div of v identical is zero. Can I use these notations, divergence and things, or, or, or there are difficulties with, 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 with this sort of thing? Hands up, who know who are, what is the divergence of vector field? OK, mostly yes. OK, so this is a divergence free vector field, then Under conditions, conditions, conditions of, of uh, non, not fast increase of v, not so of some tameness of v. Conditions uh, v. There exists a vector field. Let's call it H. R three from R three to R three such that v is the curl or rotation. I don't know which, not, which notation you, I, I usually call it curl of h. Anybody knows what the curl of a vector field is? Nobody knows what the curl of a vector field is? Some know, some don't. So divergence Curl of H is, is a vector field. So curl of H, the ice component. Uh, OK, let me put it. The first component, we have three components, is D2H3 minus D3H2. And, rota and rotated the rest. Is it clear what I'm writing? So this is derivative. So the first component is derivative with respect to y of the first, third component minus derivative with respect to z of the second component. <laughs> I will tell you in a break a story about this, about how I had what problems I had. With, I have usually with mathematics students uh, because you learn about forms and exact forms and outer forms and inner forms and all these abstract stuff. And when it's about three dimensional objects like a curl and a diver divergence, then you are in trouble. <laughs> That's a big problem. Anyway, so this is, this is Helmholtz's theorem in plain words that divergence free vector fields arise as curves. In two dimensions, it's easier to understand. But if I'm doing it, I don't want to do it on, on uh, there is something similar true on the, lat on, the, on the lattice. On the lattice. On the lattice, on the lattice, on ZD, let V, let V be a vector field. That means that V is VKX B such that vkx equals minus v minus k x plus k. This means that it, we have a flow on the lattice. Yes, forget about my story. It's related, of course, but, but I, I want to make you understand. 
And this, this, this is corresponds to vector field. And let's have it divergence free. Sum over k of v k x identically 0 for all x. Yeah? Now, under conditions, under conditions, but in our case, it will be, it will be the case. It will be true. If v is L2 shift invariant, then it will be true. Conditions. By the way, when I come back, this is not unique. There is a huge gauge to be chosen, and usually something called the Coulomb gauge is chosen. So it's no, not uniquely determined in three dimensions. Under conditions, there exists, let me call it, better I call this capital H, not for some reason. There exists an Something corresponding to that capital H, but we are on the lattice. It's not clear what is a vector, what is a, right? So I tell you, H, K, L, X, where K and L are in E, X is in Z, D, right? with some symmetries. And the symmetries are the following. First of all, h is, h is uh, odd in the indices. So h l k equals minus h k l x. And h l minus k h l minus k Give me a second. Give me a second. H L minus <coughs> K X plus K is equal to H L K X. And from these you can derive many. From these two you can derive all the symmetries. Right? First of all, what does this mean? OK, let me finish. There exists such an object with these symmetries. We call, it a, we call it a stream tensor. It's a tensor. Such that V sub k is equal to sum over L, V sub k x, h k l x. And this corresponds to Helmholtz. And I will come to some explanations to it. Question? Difficult to understand, right? First of all, what, does the, what, are, what do these symmetries mean? These symmetries mean that H is a function on the oriented plaquettes of ZD. If I have X, this is X, and this is K, and this is L, this is a plaquette with a corner at x and sitting on, on these unit vectors, you could, you could have count how many of them, right? It's uh, on the oriented plaquettes. If I orient, so this means that if you start with k, go around, come back on l, you get this value. If you start with l, go, on, go come back on k, you get the negative value. That's why on the oriented. And if you check, these symmetries tell you that if you go to this corner and take the same plaquette with the same orientation, you get the same thing. And probably I made a mistake here because, of course, this is minus. Yes. So this will tell you that this h is a function on the oriented plaquettes of Zd. What does it mean in two dimensions? What does all this mean in two dimensions? And now I will get back some of my audience, in particular the Tel Aviv uh, uh, delegation. In 2D, this means that if you have on Z2, you have a sourceless vector field on Z2 that arises as a two-dimensional rotation or curl of a height function. Who are the Tel Aviv guys? Hands up. 
Ron Pellet students, are there any? <laughs> so, if you have a sourceless flow on Z2, it arises, take a height function, a height functional dual lattice, you, that means this thing, so oriented plaquettes, values on the oriented plaquettes, and take the discrete curl, that means value on this edge will be value of h there minus value h there, and so on. So this is exactly how height functions arise in all these discrete combinatorial objects, two-dimensional discrete combinatorial objects. Right? In three dimensions, in three dimensions, functions of oriented plaquettes are what? If you think a little bit, take the dual lattice and assign to the oriented plaquette the edge of the dual lattice, the oriented edge of the dual lattice which goes in the good direction through it. So in three dimensions, these correspond to vector fields. That means exactly have the vector field structure on the dual lattice. So exactly like, as in Helmholtz. And in higher dimension, you have true tensors. So in, in mind, so the, the morale is in two dimensions, it's a, it's a scalar, it's a height function. In three dimensions, it's a, it's a vector field on the dual. And in higher, in higher dimension, it's more complex. Now here is a theorem. I said it under conditions and check the condition. By the way, in two dimensions, the choice is unique up to a constant, additive constant. That's because, because for the same reason why gradients define the original function up to an additive constant in two dimensions, but not in three. These are mar much more complex objects than gradients and, uh, and functions and potentials. The, po the symmetries are more complex. So in three dimensions, it's by no means uniqueness. You have, you check it, so you have many choices, and this is this, all this what in physics is called gauge, gauge, choice, choice, gauge, and so on. There is a canonical choice which is called Coulomb gauge, I don't tell you what it is. Those interested, look at my paper and, and see what it is. And, uh, and otherwise, you have many. And here is a theorem, which probably I will not have time to prove, but it's, it's, it's this guy, that now I go back to my V sub K. I go back to my V sub K, uh, V K, so back to V K, or me, v k x be v k tau x omega. So I, I am in the L2 setup now because these two blackboards were about general deterministically given v's. Right? Theorem one. No condition. So this is an L2. This is a, a square integrable. This is a square integrable divergence free vector field on my lattice, uh, ergodic, right? Without any conditions, there exists uniquely, and unique because the Coulomb choice, the Coulomb gate choice give it, gives it, uh, an H K L X omega, so a random field, a random field, with these symmetries, such that, such that v k x, such that these hold, such that these things hold, almost surely, right? And this is a co-cycle. This is this has stationary increments. This is a co-cycle. That means that that uh, h. I don't write the, the indices. Y x plus y omega minus h x omega is equal to h y tau x omega minus h tau x omega. I hope I didn't make a mistake. Yes. So it's a co-cycle. So that means, what does this mean? 
I have a stationary, this is stationary with my shifts. This object is a curl, is a gradient. It doesn't look like a gradient because you have this sum, but due to the symmetries, this is actually a derivative, a, a space derivative. I have a stationary object V, which is a spatial derivative of an object H. Now that object H, if it exists, it must be of stationary increments because its differences are stationary. Not stationary, stationary increments. This is always true. This is always true. If V is like in my story and is square integrable, I don't need bounded, square integrable, then this is always true. I'm sorry for not giving the proof. It's a beautiful proof and you find it in the paper. Second, and this is what interests us most, V is in H minus 1. I didn't hear I say V is in H. Question? There's something missing in the last line. Ah, sorry, you are right. Yes, I felt this. You should remember I stopped for a second. And uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, that's right. You are right. Zero. Zero was missing. Yeah. Now, here I didn't assume anything about v, just that, that, it's, uh, that it's zero mean. Ah, yes, that it's, that it's zero mean uh, divergence free vector field on the lattice. I should have put zero mean here, because otherwise, if it's not zero mean, then you have to add some linear object here. It's not important. But it's true that v is in h minus 1. This is restrictive. If and only if this h, this h in principle is stationary increment. In particular, it could be stationary. But that's a particular case. That's exactly if h is stationary and L2. So I, I write it in this way. If there exists, and I write now with slower case, h, k, l, omega, with those symmetries I gave you, with the symmetries uh, in L2, with the symmetries I gave you, namely that H L K is minus H K L and H L minus K omega tau K omega is H K L omega. And some more symmetries did, did derive from here. Such that, such that V k is sum over l h k l. And then, just one sec, then this h arises like the, as the lifting of this to the lattice. So h k x, a, capital H at x will be this h shifted by tau x. Question? That was what you wanted to ask? Yeah. So there is an element in L2 which lifted to the lattice gives this. But my, this is a terrible, this is a very important difference. This is, and I'm sorry to ask again the Tel Aviv guy. Who are here from, from Tel Aviv University? Are you with Rompelitz? No, yes. no one is Rompelitz. Because he is, he's working exactly on this story. So, when, so that's a very basic question. So the, making the difference between height functions, which are confined, that means translation, uh, stationary, not bounded, but confined means stationary, or not confined. And this is exactly that difference, just in a more complex context. In two dimensions, it's the same context. And in three dimensions, it's more because it's about the tensor field. Question? <coughs> no question. So this is my last disguise of h minus 1. And this is the fourth disguise of h minus 1. Right? h minus 1, message home for those who who are interested in this height function story and that, all that, if V arises from a, how do you call it? What is the canonical word you say when it's confined, when it's stationary? There is a canonical word they, they use in this. Sorry? Localized. Localized. 
I don't like it. I tell you why I don't like it, because it's not that spatially localized. The values are localized. That's why I always forget, because I don't like the term. <laughs> Good. And now I'm ready to tell you the results precisely. The first theorem is the, the first theorem. This is in a joint paper with Gadi, Cosma, and myself, and was published last year in the Annals of Probability. And it's the following, it's the following, under the conditions of bistochasticity, Ellipticity, boundedness. Uh, yes, I write here boundedness, but I will comment on that because I have a stronger version now. Boundedness, that means that the P, the jump rates are bounded. And H minus 1, and H minus 1. The central limit theorem holds in the following sense. And now I have to explicitly say in what sense. Take any function, take any function, let, let f be a function from Rd to R, which is continuous and bounded, then integral on omega of expectation omega of f x t by square root of t. Let me here put a sigma. OK, no, by square root of t. Uh, minus expectation of, let me put here a t, a small t, of f v, I put here a sigma t, I put here absolute values, and I integrate with respect to d pi converges to 0 as capital T converges to infinity. Very complicated thing to, to say something you would think simple, but I want to emphasize something. Right. So this is a central limit theorem. This is a central limit theorem take, ah, with some sigma non-degenerate, sigma positive definite non-degenerate. Sigma strictly positive definite non-degenerate matrix. It's not necessarily diagonal. It's a no, uh, strictly positive definite covariance matrix, which is non-degenerate, which can be computed. I mean, not explicitly, but, but bounds from below and above. What does this say? Take the random walk in the random environment. Take a Brownian motion of Brownian motion with that variant sigma. Take whatever function which is bounded and continuous on Rd, and take the difference between between the expected value of this guy and expected value with respect to the corresponding normal distribution. Take absolute value, integrate with respect to pi. And this will converge to zero. So this is the this is the central limit theorem. It's not the annealed. The annealed will be much much. Uh, the annealed, the annealed, is much less. This is much more than annealed. The annealed would be the following: take the absolute value of the integral of the difference. This is the annealed. The annealed would say that that take average over everything, and that converges. 
I don't say that. I say much more. I say in probability with respect to omega, or in L1 with respect to omega. L1 or probably is the same because this is bounded. This holds. This is much stronger. On the other hand, the quenched is even stronger. The quenched is even stronger. And I state the quenched. And this is a paper of mine which is accepted in the analysis of probability. Hopefully, it will appear this year. Which is the following. Assume, and I will comment on boundedness in a moment. So in our paper with Gadi, it's with bounded, but, but uh, it's less than, less than necessary. By stochasticity, ellipticity, let me put here boundedness, but I will comment on that. And now h, let me put like h minus 1 plus a little which I tell you what it means. I need a little bit more there. I told you that the h minus 1 condition imply, was the equivalent to saying that this, this height function or tensor is L2 stationary. I need more. This means that the height function is L2 plus epsilon. Slightly more integrable. That's necessary, otherwise you don't get it. Slightly more integrability than, than, uh, than just, just square integrability is needed. You will see why later. Then the quenched holds, that means that this thing, which is inside, for almost all omegas, for pi almost all omega, this absolute value inside, which is this, converges to zero. I will prove this, this one, because I don't have time for both, and essentially it's the same. Now, this guy is proved with all the machinery I gave you. This guy is proved in a different way, but the main tool, the main tactical part from here is used, namely self-adjointness of that bizarre operator, or skew self-adjointness. Seemingly, that bizarre operator is very, very important in all this theory. So I will take pass from here and prove that theorem, because I don't have time. That's the stronger one, and anyway, I don't have time for both. Now, I said that I comment on the boundedness The boundedness of the of the of the rates. So the called the boundedness. So the condition was the following. Remember, remember the bistochasticity. I don't repeat. Remember the ellipticity. I don't repeat. Ellipticity means lower bound on the symmetric part. Remember the boundedness meant. Boundedness meant that the S sub case omegas, which are non-negative, are bounded above by something. Which is the same as saying that the jump rates are bounded above. I don't need it. Actually, what I can show is that replace this by, by L2, which means that S sub k omega squared dp be finite, be less than some s star, which is, OK, be finite now. It's sufficient to say be finite because, because it's a number, be finite. So it's a strong, it's a, it's a, it's a strong improvement. And it, from the methods of this paper, the second one, uh, it, it, follow, it follows. But I will not show full generality because it's too much notation for that. Um, OK, so that much about about this condition. And one more remark, and then I'm done for today. If I assume more than this, so this meant, this meant h in L2, right? 
if I assume more, I assume that this height function or this, this stream tensor is actually L infinity, that reduces the problem much. That makes the problem much easier. If, yeah, that's much more than this, right? The height function is not just L2, but there is a bounded height function from which, as a curl, uh, that vector field arises. Now, this was done, this, this is essentially the same as, and now Pierre will understand what I'm saying, uh, bounded cycle representation. That you have a number of, finite number of random cycles for which you take a sort of Poisson translation invariant field, and those finite cycles define your random walk. That's the same as, that's the same as H being in L infinity. And in this case, the strong sector condition applies. Condition. So I don't need all that. And this was done all time, time ago. This was done, OK. It was done and not fully done, but, but essentially done by Kozlov back in 1985. He didn't use these terms, but he did much work by uh, Komorowski and Olla in the early 2000s. Pierre has a paper about this sort of thing with bounded cycles, but I don't recall exactly. That's about heat kernel or something. Estimate. Yeah, you tell me later. But, that, but that's, that's H being L infinity. So the point is, the main point is that the height function is not bounded, but L2. Good. Time goes faster, of course, than one is, expects. I stop here and we meet. I don't know when, when my turn is coming next. Next week, probably. See you then.